Hello, and uh, welcome to today's webinar, Take the Ache Out of Testing Sports Apparel, Equipment, and Footwear. My name is Tanner Walrath. I'm a sales engineer in the Mid-Atlantic region based out of our Trillion headquarters right outside of Philadelphia, and I'll be your monitor today for this webinar. I'm joined by our Pacific Region Technical Account Manager, Hannah Sisney, who will be presenting today's webinar, as well as our Pacific Regional Engineering and Account Manager, Charles Olivier Amiot, and he will be assisting in answering questions you may have during the uh, Q&A session. Throughout the presentation, please leave any questions you may have in the Q&A section below, and they'll be answered at the end of the webinar. With that being said, I'm going to let Hannah take over and everyone uh, just sit back and enjoy. All right. Thank you so much, Tanner. Uh, I appreciate that introduction. Uh, like Tanner said, my name is Hannah. I will uh, be your uh, host for the rest of the webinar. I'm a technical account manager with our Pacific Coast team, joined by Charles. Uh, rounding out our Pacific Coast team are Steve and Jerem, who are our applications engineers. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it to the webinar today, but nonetheless, we have a great uh, presentation planned for you all. So let's get started. A little bit about Trillion. Like Tanner said, we're headquartered just outside of Philadelphia, and we have representatives and offices across the U.S. and Canada to best serve the needs of all of our clients. Throughout our time in business, we've had the pleasure of working with schools and companies in a variety of different industries. Uh, for the sports and outdoor industry, these include companies like Adidas and Nike, and there are over 16,000 GOM systems installed worldwide. We are the exclusive North American distributor for GOM, which is a German company held under Zeiss that develops software, machines, and systems for industrial and automated 3D coordinate measuring technology and 3D testing. Our systems include Aramis for optical strain measurement, digital image correlation, and photogrammetry, Argus for optical forming analysis, Tritop for mobile optical CMM purposes, GOM CT for 3D x-ray scanning, and ATOS for full field 3D scanning. The ATOS core that's pictured there can also support Aramis and is great for all of your 3D digital image correlation needs on the go. So today we'll be focusing on Aramis and CT, but together all of these systems make up the foundation of Trillion's engineering services. As a company, we're in the business of system sales, engineering services, customer support, and training. We want our clients to be using these systems to their full potential to achieve not only their goals that they set out initially, but beyond what they thought was possible in the world of testing. I also want to add a disclaimer that the pictures taken here were taken before the pandemic hit and lockdown restrictions put in place. So these were all very safe events uh, for our customers to attend training. So we're going to start by covering Aramis, which is our most used system in our region. This is a system for non-contact full field 3D deformation analysis. Traditionally, when engineers and designers are testing, they're using mechanical point solutions such as extensometers, accelerometers, and strain gauges, uh, which are all good for giving you a lot of data on only one point in your material, uh, not to mention that they're tedious and wasteful most of the time. We turn to finite element modeling and analysis to get a fuller picture of what's going on in our material, but these are simulations, and simulations are only as good as our assumptions. So this is where Aramis comes in to bridge the gap between uh, testing and simulation. Aramis gives us a lot of data on every single point on the material. So it really gives you that full 360 degree picture of what's going on during testing. And you want to emphasize the capability of Aramis to validate and calibrate these computer models as seen in the FDA world. But how does it work, you might ask? Uh, Aramis creates 3D images for 3D digital image correlation the same way that we create images. So we use our two eyes to take in input from the world around us, and our brain turns those into images for uh, thinking about them and in, in, in analysis. And this is the same way that Aramis uh, does this, using its two cameras to take in input, and the software turns those into 3D images for analysis. So some examples of what Aramis can do are point tracking uh, with dynamic photogrammetry. So we use these target dots. Uh, they're just a sheet of stickers. We'll put them on whatever we want to track. The example here is this prosthetic leg. And we're tracking the movement of the prosthetic leg through 3D space. And what's interesting about this example is that it is tracking the motion in relation to the knee of the prosthesis itself. We also uh, use Aramis optical strain through digital image correlation. We use these randomized speckle patterns that we apply to materials. And you can see the full strain behavior of the material through a pencil test. In this instance, uh, just a regular material coupon, looking at all of that strain behavior during its test. 
These examples are just a few ways that Aramis is the ultimate multi-purpose full-field dynamic sensor. Its non-contact capabilities help expedite measurement setup and accelerate your test schedules. Its full-field data lets you gain insight into both global and local behaviors of your parts. All-in-one measurement solutions, uh, they provide 3D coordinates, displacements, and strain fields. The flexibility of the technology future-proofs it for micro to macro scale measurements. Material independence provides versatility and reduces equipment redundancy. Static and dynamic testing expands your testing capabilities. And it's designed to adapt to your evolving needs. Uh, also, I'll mention the motion compensation that makes it insensitive to rigid body motions or environmental vibrations. And like I was saying, it is designed to adapt to your evolving needs. So the platform is compatible with many different accessories and modules to broaden your test capability. And uh, again, we're validating those new we are validating those numerical simulations with full field data, and if these can expedite and improve your product development cycle overall. And the wonderful thing about Aramis is that there is no standard application. In a few moments, I'll be sharing uh, multiple examples of tests in your industry, but there are many, many different tests that have been performed with our products, and they're all driven by our customers. Your standard is our standard. That is an overview of Aramis. We're now going to jump into GOM CT, but I will remind um, you for any questions, please drop them in the question area of the chat boxes there. And so we'll just jump into the next portion of uh, this presentation with GOM CT. This is 3D X-ray chromatology, inspecting internal structure of complex parts. It's just like a CT scan you would get at the hospital, only it's a lot less terrifying. Uh, we're looking at small components and assemblies. Uh, they really can be anything. For instance, this is the inside of a headphone that you might wear uh, during a workout, while you're running, etc. And so in less than five minutes, you can use the CT to scan your specimen, the headphone for instance, and have what we call its digital twin uh, in the software ready for analysis. So the total diameter of this part was one centimeter, and the diameter of this single grid element here is um, less than a millimeter, about a tenth of a millimeter. And with CT, we're looking at these imperfections that are below the micron in size. So this is just extremely detailed work you can do here. Here's an exciting slide that shows all of the amazing applications benefits available with the software and the hardware. I won't bore you by reading the entire thing, but I do just want to point out the ability of the technology to tackle non-destructive reverse engineering as well as material development, along with the simple workflow, its easy positioning, and automatic scanning. So we'll take a look at a few examples of CT here. Uh, one being in our lab, we uh, used our uh, machines to crush a golf ball, and then we looked at what was going on inside the crushed golf ball with our CT machine. So you can see exactly what's going on inside there, and I personally have never seen the inside of a golf ball unless you uh, count the ride at Disney World, so I think this is a pretty interesting use of uh, the CT machine here for analysis of your equipment. We also can use CT to look at meshes, like the ones that are found throughout the sports and apparel footwear industry. Uh, this is with Lattice, for instance. Uh, we tested for a client. It's just one of 6.7 million nodes in a mesh. We're looking at measurements on all of them. This is how these measurements are taken as part of a test, and so there's different levels of loading. You can see how the nodes behave, again, below the micron level in detail at each stage of loading. So these are just some examples of really how detailed you can be with the GOM CT system. So we're going to move on now uh, back to our work with Aramis and we're going to take a look at examples for testing sports and outdoor apparel equipment and footwear. This is a basic example of strain behavior that you can visualize in a t-shirt. Uh, we just put a random pattern on a t-shirt and looked at the strain behavior uh, while the model was doing some stretches. This is a test that we did for a client of ours in our office. We have a model doing a downward dog yoga pose, and we drop some points of interest on the material, and you can see how it behaves um, on the graphs there to the side throughout the entirety of the pose. And so we're looking at stretching in the seam region to see if it's strong enough, the strain behaviors, all of those uh, wonderful things there. We do get a lot of questions um, about our patterning, our materials, our uh, promotional materials do a lot of uh, black dots on a white background, but you can definitely use white dots on a black background or anything that really has a lot of contrast. This was uh, just a pair of black leggings. We patterned it with white fabric paint. You can see the strain behavior there. Uh, same pair of leggings, same uh, good strain behavior uh, in this test. 
just uh, easy pattern to buy a fabric paint you get at the craft store. So this is a test we did for a client as well, um, showing local reinforcement design in sports bras. This was recorded while the athlete was running on a treadmill. And while it wasn't a part of this test, it has been suggested that you could x-ray this bra with the CT machine uh, to analyze the position, the alignment of the reinforcement fibers once the assembly is complete for quality assurance purposes, for comfort validation. Also for fatigue testing, you could x-ray the bra after 10 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours, etc. of use and see if these fiber positions have changed or realign themselves under this loading. So there are ways to uh, really bring these systems together and use them in parallel with one another to get that full field sense of what's going on in your material. We have another example of a bra here for another client of ours, worn by the design engineer herself, uh, showing strain flows during a jump. This is an interesting uh, test that I think we did for using um, a mirror to get 3D reconstruction from the medial and lateral sides of a foot. You use a regular makeup or stage makeup to pattern the skin, and then you can see the major strain and minor strain behavior of the foot while it's running on different uh, materials, so grass, concrete, a gym floor, sand, et cetera, and you can see all those strain behaviors there. This is a similar test with the foot. We're looking at the strain behavior in your toes, and so you can see each toe is graphed out on the side uh, during the stride of a walk. And so I believe Charles was actually our model here. So thank you, Charles, for this, uh, this wonderful test during a walk. This is the same test, but it's just looking at the mesh itself and uh, visualizing the strain direction and the strain flow uh, during this stride. And you can see that go through there. So naturally, the next step from being barefoot is putting on your shoes. And here's an early example of a shoe measurement. We're looking at both the strain behavior and the strain direction in this shoe, uh, tested uh, early on at our, our parent company, Gum. And this leads into the famous Adidas Alpha Bounce. Um, this is a pattern which was found by a designer walking by the test area one night in Adidas headquarters. He liked the pattern so much that he created a digital version and added it to the catalog, and you can now order your own Aramis views, but the data is not included. <laughs> Moving on to equipment, this is a test done at a bat lab at University of Massachusetts Lowell with our high-speed cameras, so you can see uh, the displacement of the bat as it's impacted at the high speed. This is a test in our office, we have a golf ball and a putter that the mesh has been animated, and then you can visualize the different points of movement on those graphs around the mesh uh, to really get a sense of this uh, six degree of freedom motion that we can measure of the putter and the ball. And we clearly had an intern with not enough to do because this is one of our uh, applications engineers crossbows that uh, was analyzed with our high speed system. Uh, you can see the arrow and the bow, how those behave in movement uh, during the test. And I'm told that no interns were harmed in the making of this video. <laughs> and finally, here's an example of testing hockey blades for a Canadian company, of course. And you can see how each uh, point on the blade is moving when it becomes in contact with the puck. So those are just a few examples of everything that you can accomplish with Aramis, with CT. But I'm sure you're wondering how it all actually works. And so we're going to jump into a demonstration. Um, unfortunately, our applications uh, engineers couldn't be with us today, uh, but thankfully, Jerem was able to send over a video of him doing his uh, typical demonstration, so I'm going to play that now, and then uh, we can take questions at the end of the webinar um, and look specifically at the software as well. Hi, my name is Jerem Hess. I'm an engineer here at Filling Quality Systems, and today we're going to be looking at our sports webinar, and specifically, we're going to use our 12-megapixel Aramis uh, camera system here. You can see we have uh, two cameras, our stereo camera system, and uh, we've basically set this system up right now for our current measuring volume, about 470 millimeters. Okay. That means we have to change basically the distance between our cameras here, and also our focus and aperture in order to get the correct focus and depth of field uh, for our measuring volume. You can see we also have the system on a nice stereo stand here. We're able to adjust both the height and depth of our area, and this is our area of interest, and we'll look at what it is we're going to be expecting. So now we've moved into the Aramis professional software here. I'll go ahead and just show you the user interface right now. We're on the start menu. We have a lot of different options here. It's very simple and user friendly. Create a new project, open existing, or some other options here. I'll go ahead and start a new system. 
I want to recreate, sorry, a new project here is going to bring me as long as the camera system right now is uh, turned on with our sensors. Now it's going to bring me into the stage acquisition workspace here. So you can see if I toggle this button here, there's numerous workspaces that we have. We have first our setup. This is where we determine our measuring volume. And everything in the software is very user friendly and basically allows us to go from top to bottom and left to right. So we work through our workspaces, top to bottom. And then each time we get to a new workspace, we usually move in order of these functions left to right. So if I go to stage acquisition here, you can see my first function is take a reference image, then create a surface, and then start off with my measuring sequence. Our system is already connected here, so I'll go ahead and start. In the 3D view here, it has been so kind for us to model the t-shirt that we've gone ahead and applied a cycle pattern to. And we've set up our system right now to look at about a 470 millimeter measuring volume. You can see in the initial setup here, we have our start menu. In setup is where we set up our measuring volume and uh, our focus and aperture for our cameras, as well as the calibration. And then now we can move right into taking and acquiring our images. So first off, I'm going to use a feature of this Aramis system, uh, basically known as binning, where we can run at a faster rate of speed. So I'm going to run at about 100 hertz so we can get a good uh, view of the stretching that this fabric goes through uh, during flex. And I'll go ahead and set that up here right now. In order to run a typical uh, digital image correlation uh, analysis, we need to have a reference image to base our uh, motion off of. So right now I'm taking a reference image at the 100 hertz uh, for one image here. You can see that uh, that's currently displayed right here in the 3D view. I'm also going to go ahead and check my surface pattern here. And I'm going to do that by creating a surface component. And here we can see basically um, what our surface looks like currently with our uh, chosen parameters. So right now you can see the software automatically tracks where the surface is found. And it can basically create these uh, facet squares here, uh, where it's going to use that data for looking at uh, strains and displacements. Uh, the only thing we need to make sure is that those values are uh, chosen correctly for the correct speckle pattern size. So it looks like we have a good pattern here. And right now we're looking at, if I go to the information here, about 5,600 points of interest or node points on, on this current surface. So we're getting about 5,000 uh, strain points of data. So if I'm happy with this, I'm also going to go ahead and restrict what my surface is on this so that we don't have any overlap off in the space or on the parts that may not have an actual pattern on them. So I'll go ahead and restrict that now just by drawing a quick and simple area around my surface. There we go. A nice clean surface there. We can go ahead and click on create and close if we're done with creating our surface. And now we are ready basically to start doing some uh, image acquisition for our actual tests. Something that's also good to look into is our noise source. So basically how much noise we're getting inherent from the system or from the surroundings. And we can go ahead and use some data to find that by taking a few extra images here of just static uh, images, with no motion. Go ahead and make sure I'm on the same settings as before. I'll go ahead and take about 10 images right now, just in place. So no movements. And you can see here, if I go ahead and recalculate the surface on those uh, 10 images here, you can see we have a pretty good surface, not too much movement or distortion there. And what we can do is inspect our surface now if we wanted to, to look at noise uh, for our quantities of interest. And we typically look at our standard deviation and average uh, of our values and quantities of interest in order to see uh, what kind of noise we're looking at. And we can do that after the fact here uh, as well. So now I'm ready to start doing the actual flex portion of the test. So I'll go ahead and go back to my start acquisition series here. We're going to go ahead and add a simple trigger element, user input, 
Now you can see the software is maxed us out at 827 images uh, total that we can take in this one test, uh, just based off the RAM of the system here. So I'll go ahead and have that. And I'll go ahead and keep my measuring mode at 100. And I'll actually just run uh, for about the same length as we have available, just so we can include all that uh, for acquisition. So I'll go ahead and click OK here. And then once it's ready, it's going to give me a prompt. So now I can either start the test or exit. So now we'll go ahead and start the test. There we go. And now it's adding the images from our test. Okay, so you can see here now that uh, we have on the bottom of our timeline, we have our reference image here. We have our noise floor that we can look through if we need to for uh, considerations there. And then we also have our test here. I can play through it. You can see on um, the flex of the shirts. And then as we release, uh, hopefully we'll be able to see some uh, release and strain and displacement. So I can go ahead and start by uh, going into our inspection workspace now. And then we'll go ahead and take a look at some of our quantities of interest. So for instance, if we wanted to look at displacements, we can look at total displacement here on the surface. And as you can see, you can play through the test now. You know, showing uh, total displacement from the reference image. Something else that's kind of nice as well is to change our scaling here. So now we're looking at the min and max values across uh, the entire test. And we can also display a histogram uh, of our test here, kind of showing uh, the trend of points on the surface. Now this is total displacement, as I said, based on the reference image. We can also use something called a rigid body motion compensation, which basically will show us uh, motion relative to the whole body movement of the shirt. So I'll go ahead and select that right here. That's going to briefly recalculate. Now this motion is going to be based off uh, if there's any relative motion on the shirt itself. So you can see here, you get some pretty interesting results here. You can see kind of striations in the uh, fabric here as we're pulling. As well as, you know, we're kind of seeing our maximum areas basically now of displacement on the surface. And these kind of fairly well coordinate, uh, correlate, excuse me, back to our uh, strain values here or areas of strain. Now, one thing that's uh, kind of nice as well, as you can see, we have the full field color pattern. Uh, showing us based off our legend what those values are. Something that we can actually do as well is place down some points of interest to kind of see the data uh, at those points. So I'll go ahead and do that here once we save. So I'll put down something called the deviation label on some areas of interest here. So I'll say, you know, the edges here, kind of in this area of higher strain, the one there, our lower strain uh, kind of portion here, top here, and maybe on the uh, left shoulder there. Now I can open up a diagram and I can actually see at the same time as I play through my test, you can see what the exact values are of our uh, displacement here over time uh, on our shirt. Now if we're interested in getting this data separate here in order to use for further analysis, we can go ahead and just uh, use this button here to export that data as CSV files. We can put in our parameters here and then just uh, export those as CSVs. Let's take a look at our next option here. We'll look at major strain now. So let's do major strain now on the surface. Now we're in percent here, so we can kind of see like our max is about there. So we can see that uh, our majority, uh, sorry, the areas of higher strain here, again, kind of towards the edges, we're expecting it. And if I go out into the 3D view here, you can see uh, the shape of the shirt as well as uh, those areas now uh, of strain. And again, if we're interested in those data uh, points, we can go ahead and place some more labels here. Now we have again our labels and our diagram uh, showing the values. 
And again, if we just want to export this data, we can go ahead and just use our, that uh, icon there to export our CSV files. Something else that's really cool and a unique uh, feature with our Amazon software is that you can create a uh, report page from this, basically previewing or showing off what it is you see in the 3D view as well as the diagram here. So I'll go ahead and click on this button here, this icon. Now I can call this report page anything I want. So I can say t-shirts, t-shirts, major strain. I can then edit my image here so I can kind of show off a little bit better in the full field view here what the image looks like. I can move these labels around. And now I've created a simple report page here showing the diagram uh, next to our full field color plot. I can either create this as a video or an image and they can dictate if I want a video how long the video would be. If I click OK here, now it's going to render my video and place it in my uh, report section of my workspace. So once this uh, fully renders, we'll go ahead and take a look at that now in the next report space of our software. I will mention as well that as we've created this report page, uh, the Aramis software is very user-friendly. You can see all we have to do is work from top to the bottom on our workspaces here. And every time we open a new workspace, going left to right, we have kind of our main options. You can see for creating our service components, doing our inspections, putting down our labels, and then finally creating that uh, report page that we did earlier. So I'll go ahead and go to the report workspace now. And you can see we have our new report page here. I've given it to the title of T-shirt major strain. We can always update this afterwards. We can also change uh, the view of our image here after we've actually created a report page if we need to. And at the very bottom of the page here, we have a play sign. I can play through a uh, video here so you can just kind of see what it looks like. Perfect. Now, if we'd like to export this report page, we can go ahead and right click on it. Go to export report page and we have the options here for either PDF, a PNG, or the entire page, or just this central area here as videos. And you can choose uh, select where you'd like to save this as well. And once I do that, I basically encode the video and exports it uh, for viewing. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much to Jerem for sending that video over. Uh, that really helps to uh, give a good sense of how you're actually using this technology in your workspace. But you use all this great technology, you get all these wonderful data, but you're kind of wondering, like, what am I really using it for and how am I telling people how I've used it? So Jerem and I went ahead and came up with some reporting examples. And so uh, here is just the same exact t-shirt. That's me doing the same exact movement, just in two different sizes of the t-shirt. And we can compare those two different sizes and look at some of the differences in them and uh, how we would use those to uh, make a report. And so for instance, in the median t-shirt, we're looking at total displacement and we have some points of interest drop down there and we can see how they behave and uh, throughout the entirety of the test. And we can compare that to the large t-shirt by dropping down a point of interest in similar places, looking at the displacement mapped out on the graph. And we can see that the large t-shirt uh, experiences maximum displacement. So we could tell our colleagues about that and they would make decisions based on that information regarding the medium or large t-shirt. Same thing with strain, for instance. We put down these uh, points of interest on the t-shirt. We look at the strain behavior all mapped out. Same thing with the large t-shirt, and we can see that the large t-shirt experiences maximum strain. So those are just a few examples of how you can use this technology to do comparisons, to report, all those wonderful things. Which brings us to the end of this presentation. I like to say that I get a kick out of using Aramis for my measurements, uh, but it really has been a pleasure to present to you all here today. And now we're going to turn it over back to Tanner, our moderator, for some questions. So thank you all so much for being uh, such a wonderful audience. 
All right. Awesome. Thank you, Hannah. That was that was great. Um, I think we have a few questions that rolled in here to the Q&A. It looks like Charles chimed in and answered one of them, and then I also answered one as well. So I'm going to start with uh, these questions here. I'll just go over the ones that were already asked and answered, just so if, if any of you may have missed them uh, in that Q&A box down there, you'll, uh, you'll hear them now. So the first one that was already answered is, how dynamic are the measurements and what is the acquisition rate? Charles answered this one and explained how the examples shown throughout this presentation vary between uh, test to test. And the frame rate is driven by the camera used for the test. And we have a, a range of more quasi-static cameras, which are ideal for load frame testing, um, for instance, material characterization, and then a multitude of faster cameras in the 500 to 2000 FPS range. But for dynamic, for bare dynamic requirements, we've done work in the 100,000 to 500,000 uh, plus range using high-speed cameras. So you know, one of the great things about this this software here is that we can pair it with a set of high-speed cameras in order to get these dynamic measurements. And we just import the high-speed images into Aramis and can analyze them just as we would if we we're using a standard sensor. So hopefully uh, that answered your question for you there. The next one, which I, um, I answered for Anna, was <clears throat> what is the best way to apply the speckle pattern onto a textile for strain measurements with Aramis? So in my answer here, I kind of explained that for over 90% of DIC, standard flat or matte white and black spray paint are used. One would be used as a base coat, and then one would be used as the speckles on top of that. So you kind of, uh, <clears throat> you saw this in Hannah's presentation here, where she actually used the natural color of the, the article of clothing as that base coat. So she had a white t-shirt. She didn't have to lay down a white base coat on top of that t-shirt. All she had to do was apply the black speckles. So how you do your pattern is really going to vary on the type of test you do. Um, you could even print the pattern onto the textile, as we saw with the Adidas example on the shoe. Um, those are real shoes that they do produce. And we could take any of those shoes and make a measurement with them today just based off of that pattern that they printed on there. Uh, the key points with the pattern that you just want to keep in mind, no matter what test you're running, is that you want the pattern to be high contrast, randomized, and non-reflective. If you're in a situation where you can't get a non-reflective pattern, we are able to apply polarizers to our sensors in order to further reduce glare. Um, the reason glare can be an issue is that uh, you know both sensors must see the same the same thing in order to triangulate. So by getting rid of any glare, um, both sensors are seeing the exact same grayscale values within the uh, within the images, and they can easily track the uh, all the different data points. Uh, yeah, for those uh, leggings and t-shirts examples that we're doing in the lab, we just use uh, fabric spray paint, and so we found that at our local craft store, and that was a really great way to get a randomized pattern onto fabric. Yep. Great. Thank you for that. All right, and then we had a, a question here. Um, Charles, you may, you may have to answer this one, but do you have any idea on the smallest size object that can be visualized by the CT application? Um, that's a good question. So depending on the, um, on the CT model that we pick, we have different capabilities. Uh, the, the one that we were showing in Anna's presentation there, the Metro Tom 6, actually has a moving stage, so we can uh, get the part uh, much closer. Uh, it's a, like we saw in the small earbuds uh, data, data set, um, it's a 3K sensor, which means we have 3,000 pixels uh, on, the, on the detector. And so we can get a part that's down to about 10 millimeters to be the full field of the, uh, of the detector. Uh, now we can still measure something much smaller uh, than this, but we can have you know a really small, tight uh, field of view, uh, and that's how we get uh, this quality of data on the earbuds uh, by using a really small field of view. Uh, so even if your field of view is a little bit bigger than the part, that's not necessarily an issue. It depends on what you're trying to actually measure. Um, for CT, the kind of, I want to say, main concern uh, is often more about what the density of the material uh, to really get that nice and fine quality um, mesh. So it's, it's really application-based, uh, I, I guess I'd say. But uh, yeah, we can definitely do some very, really small things under half an inch uh, and still have really high resolution with that, uh, with that CT machine. 
Great. Thanks, Charles. I'll uh, move on to the next one here from Tom. So are, are these uh, materials, Hannah, that you've been showing throughout this presentation, are they available for uh, people to use for teaching, say, at a, at a university or undergraduate level or anything like that? And do you have any additional resources for students? Yeah, we do have um, educational packages that come with that kind of their own guides on how to teach DIC at, uh, at universities for students for that educational sphere. And so that's certainly something that we can work with individu individual educators on to make sure that they're most well equipped to discuss DIC with their students. And um, yeah, basically everything kind of that we've shown today that is on the Trillion's, uh, on Trillion's YouTube page or our website. Those are all great examples to share with people to get them excited about DIC and uh, really uh, show them that there's a lot to learn and it's a, it's a great space to be in. Yeah, I just added into the chat uh, a link for everyone to see and I sent it to obviously also the, uh, the person that asked the question here. But um, yeah, you can go on our website and actually request uh, what we call our education starter package. Um, and we will send you, you know, um, USB licenses, which already have the software preloaded on it. You can have access to unlimited uh, GOM correlate licenses, which allow you to do analysis um, and to get your students to experience the software on their own so they don't just have to see it. They can actually try it themselves. Uh, we have sample data that, is, that, uh, that they can download uh, on their own as well. And uh, in that, uh, educational starter package will also send you some posters and some materials for courses, some like quizzes that are already pre-made uh, and stuff like that. So a lot of materials to kind of help educators really kickstart uh, any discussions about DIC in their classes or in their program. Um, you know, I, I think we, uh, we, we often quote uh, Mike Mello uh, and uh, University of California that uh, always kept saying the same thing, but he said, you know, about 10 or 12 years ago, he said, if you're not teaching DIC today, then you're living in the dark cages. Uh, and so just getting more and more true. I mean, um, I, I think it's fair to assume that engineering programs, you want to be able to present uh, digital sensors more and more. And I mean, train gauges and, um, and LDDTs are great, but they're really old technologies that don't necessarily get um, students as excited uh, as, as using uh, new technologies and, and FDA-like uh, softwares. Great. Yeah, thanks, Charles. And I'll just, I'll add a little bit to that, too. Um, you know, the great thing, one of the great things about the, the GOM Correlate software that's free and available to all of you is that you can use any camera you want uh, in tandem with this software to make DIC measurements. So you could even use your, your cell phone, for instance, and just upload those images into the software and uh, be doing 2D DIC almost instantaneously. So. You know, I, I suggest anyone that's interested in, in looking into that just to download the free software and kind of play around with it a little bit and uh, get familiar with it. All right, and then we have a question from Paul. Um, hello, Paul. Looks like you're out in Germany, so thank you for tuning in. I'm not sure what the uh, what the time zone is like over there right now, but I'm sure it's not as convenient as the time as we're uh, looking at. But <clears throat> regardless, uh, Paul asked us: Is the choice of cameras fixed? Or could I, for instance, also use phantom high-speed cameras with the software? Um, I think he's asking if the, the type of high-speed camera is fixed. He put in parentheses Photron after his uh, initial statement. So to answer your question, you can use any um, high-speed cameras with our software. You just need to be able to obviously export the images out of the, that high-speed software. And then what you would also do um, within the high-speed software itself is you would run through the calibration sequence that the Aramis software would traditionally guide you through. But this is going to be an unguided sequence, so you would just be going along by with step-by-step um, -step instructions as far as the position of the panel. And you would take your series of images just as you would within the software. And then after, that, um, <clears throat> after those calibration images are taken, you would then upload them into the software, uh, into the GOM Correlate Professional software or Aramis software, and you would create a calibration file from those images, and then you would use that calibration file with any uh, test images that you may take, regardless of the, the type of camera, and then after that point, you would be analyzing the project just as you would any Aramis project. So to answer your question, um, any brand of cameras will work. We're not necessarily tied down to to any particular brand. It's just a, it's a preference for the user as far as what they're most familiar with or what they're most comfortable with 
or maybe maybe uh, what cameras they already might have instead of having to get new ones. On that uh, question, I mean, uh, we're trailing in the U.S. of a partner with more camera vendors, um, and it really depends on your applications. I will will suggest different ones, and like Tanner said, uh, ease of use based on your applications. Uh, but uh, I, I know that in Germany they uh, have developed more uh, relationships with Photon, and there's actually also in the Golem software some uh, tools to altogether avoid using the acquisition software from. Uh, from the cameras themselves, so you can really do everything from within the Aramis environment. Uh, and just like we saw in Jeremy's presentation where he had the live images inside of Aramis and adding images in, in there, uh, you can basically control and do the uh, calibration with guidance within the Golem environment. Um, so they're, they're the camera of choice over there, but it, like Tanner said, you can create calibrations and build projects uh, with, any, um, with any camera vendors. Yep. Thanks, Charles. All right, this one's from Harry. Uh, with the free downloadable software, could it be used to track the movement of particles on a surface? Um, I'm not too clear on uh, what he means. Now, we can definitely track um, displacements as long as we have contrast, like we saw in the initial slides from Anna. Uh, if we have a black and white speckle uh, contrast or if we have target dots, we could track them in 2D. I'm not sure what you mean by particles. Um, we'll we'll follow up with you about that. But um, yeah, generally speaking, we can track any change in the in, in a series of images as long as we have black and white contrast. Uh, so if your particles are are moving sideways up and down, uh, then we should be able to to track them. Now, one big flaw of of 2D that we have to bear in mind is that obviously we get uh, we don't have any out of plane motion. Um, so that's uh, that's obviously not going to be uh, computed as you try to track the movement of those particles, if anything comes closer or further away from the cameras, if it's not flat in plane to the camera motion, then uh, you'll, you'll get error from this. All right, thank you. Um, an anonymous attendee has asked us if there's any tutorials available to use our own camera with the GOM software. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, I actually believe this is one of the topics we went over in our, our past training at Trillion. So we, if, if that is the case, we would have a, a video on this that we could distribute um, if you just kind of reach out to us individually. Um, <clears throat> but it, it, it's a really simple process. Really all you need to do is just get the images onto your computer and then you'll just open up the free software and you're literally just gonna drag and drop those images into the free software. And then you'll just set your scale uh, based off of, you know, whether it's a, a ruler in the image or um, a certain object that you know the dimensions of, anything like that. And then after you set your scale, you'll be kind of off and running uh, with your own analysis. Yeah. Um, I had a link to the training.com.com platform. So we have a, uh, an open training e-learning platform. Uh, you can all create accounts to it if you'd like. Uh, it's free, and it also ties back to you know the discussion about uh, students earlier. If um, if you want to go and check that up, there's an e-learning course on how to use GOM Correlate, uh, and it goes over step by step the interface and the software and how to pattern, uh, as well as how to do analysis uh, using your own camera for 2D uh, purposes. Um, so it's all covered in, the, in those tutorials on the training.com.com. Like Tanner said, if, if you want to have specific for more 3D uh, recordings, I mean, you need uh, a professional license for that, and uh, that would be more for like IC video and stuff like that. So feel free to reach back out, the anonymous attendee, uh, send an email out to Anna uh, uh, by email, and uh, we can we can send you you know specific uh, documentation about that. Great. Yep, thank you. And um, it looks like we might have had one slip through in the chat here, um, just asking if we can use iPhone cameras for GOM. The answer to that, I think we just kind of answered uh, the answer is yes. So. so I know you mentioned, um, you know, Hannah, earlier in the presentation that you could go from, from micro to macro. So could you give me more of a, a definite range of specimen sizes that we could use this technology for? Yeah, definitely, Tanner. Thanks, Ross. 
asking. Um, so we kind of like to say that if you can see it, you can measure it. And we have experiences uh, making measurements on anything from microelectronics, like Charles is referring to, to uh, giant airplanes. So uh, that's a pretty big range. Uh, typically, with one air mist system, you can cover anywhere from 20 millimeters to 5 meters, uh, depending on the configuration. And then you could use multiple air mist systems to get something even bigger than that. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's, our, that's our basic range, but it all depends on your system. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to the next one here. So talking more about the speckle pattern that you kind of uh, touched on earlier in your presentation. So how long did it kind of take you to, to get good at doing this? Was there a bit of a learning curve or were you uh, up and running uh, pretty quickly? Um, just tell me more about that. Yeah, it's certainly, it is a bit of a learning curve. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm not the greatest artist in the world. Um, but I was kind of learning how to uh, do the speckle patterns with just your regular spray paint you get at the hardware store, uh, wherever you can find it. And I was uh, getting the hang of it in about like 20 or 30 minutes. So it didn't take me long at all. And it obviously uh, is easier with practice over time. So I've spent a lot of time spray painting uh, patterns in my driveway. Uh, but I think that, you know, once you get the hang of it, it's not it's not too hard at all, and um, it doesn't take much time. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll just add to that as well. Um, you know, if you did decide to, to get one of our systems during the training session, we do dedicate an amount of time to training you how to pattern things um, with whichever method is going to be best for your testing. So we're not just going to leave you with the technology and uh, wish you the best of luck. We're going to actually show you how to go through every single step and make sure you're ready to go uh, by the time we leave. All right. So, you know, with, um, with a sensor like this, people might be concerned about the, the accuracy, especially compared to the traditional single point sensors that, that they're probably used to using for such a long time. Um, with one of these systems, are you are you suffering on accuracy at all? Uh, what what is the accuracy like for one of these? Uh, definitely not. It's, it's again, it depends on the system exactly. But we like to say that your accuracy can be one one hundredth to one thirtieth of a pixel. This can translate to a sensitivity of less than a micrometer, depending on your field of view. Um, I know uh, Charles and even you, Tanner, can speak to some of the experiences you've had with this accuracy. But uh, again, it depends. But we're kind of looking at those very, very tiny portions of a pixel. And it's very accurate. You're not losing out on any data. Yeah, definitely. And like, like Hannah said, um, you know, our accuracy is going to be mostly affected when, when we're looking at displacements. So it's going to scale uh, depending on your field of view. So the larger the object is, you know, your pixels are going to be larger in that case. Therefore, your metric of 1 100th or 1 30th of a pixel is going to grow larger and larger. So that will change. But as far as our strain accuracy goes, typically we're actually um, right around 100 micro strain can get down to the, the 50 range for an ideal test setup. But when you're talking about the, the noise of a strain measurement, there's a lot of factors that are built into that. Um, everything from having the perfect pattern to having the perfect calibration, the perfect hardware setup, et cetera, all of that will go into your strain accuracy. So it's very important to just pay attention to every step and uh, do your best the whole way through just so that you can uh, optimize which, whatever data you're interested in getting. And then it looks like we have, um, I think we have two more questions here. Uh, one from Vernon was, if we're using a cell phone to capture images, uh, what type of images do we capture? Yeah. Um, so that's true, not just for you know a phone, but for any also DSLR or webcam that you'd want to use. Um, our first recommendation is, if you can, in any way, install a software and application that will give you a series of image. Um, it's usually better to do that uh, instead of building a video. That being said, you can in any case import a video, uh, but videos will always be compressed by whatever acquisition software you're using. Uh, that will change uh, and affect the pixels and will add noise to your measurements, sometimes making it all together um, uh, really hard to keep track uh, over a long period of time of your, uh, of your, part, of your specimens. Um, if you also can do it, we uh, prefer having black and white images. 
Uh, now, if it's just black and white processing from your software, it doesn't re really matter, then you might as well do it in color. Gom Carlite will process the data in color, but your pixels are just much smaller uh, when you're using uh, color images. Uh, and yeah, I'm, usually if you use your phone, if you just maintain the uh, shot button, it will do a series of recording and it will take images uh, in, in a burst. And that's prefer, preferable to recording a long, uh, long-term video. Uh, obviously, you know, whatever you do, it's often going to lead to um, motion if you are touching the camera itself. Uh, so use a small remote uh, or if it's a webcam, you know, uh, trigger it from your computer or whatnot. It's, uh, these are all uh, little uh, tips that will make your measurement a little bit better and a little bit more uh, accurate. All right, thank you. And I think we've got one last question here before we wrap it up. Um, Anonymous asked again. Yes, uh, he or she asks, where can we get the Aramis spray paint? And uh, the answer to this is really simple. Um, pretty much anywhere you can find just standard spray paint, whether it be Walmart or Home Depot, um, any other sort of hardware store or you know Lowe's, whatever it may be. We do prefer to use a, uh, a certain type, just we found that it, it works the best as far as being a, a matte color as well as adhering and all of that good stuff. And that, that type is Rust-Oleum 2X paint and primer. And again, you wanna make sure that you're either using flat or matte paint for this just to reduce any glare. Um, <clears throat> different types of spray paint we found will actually give you larger or smaller speckles. So typically this uh, Rust-Oleum 2X is used pretty broadly across the board from, from larger specimens. But there's actually a cheaper paint called, I, I believe it's called the Colorway paint, and you can find this at Walmart. And these cans actually spray um, much smaller speckles than the Rust-Oleum cans do. So you would use one of these cans for, uh, for smaller fields of view, sub 30 millimeters and, and stuff like that. Um, but again, whatever you're trying to do or whatever you're trying to pattern, during the training, we would make sure that you you know the appropriate way to effectively make those measurements. So it's it's pretty application specific, so it's hard to speak generally. But for the most part, really any store that sells spray paint, you'll be able to find uh, paint that's compatible with Aramis. All right, we have a, a few more minutes left, but I, I think I'm all out of questions here. So I just wanted to thank you again, everybody, for uh, joining in. It, it was a pleasure moderating, and, and thank you, Hannah and Charles, for, for all the information you gave us today. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here and let you two, uh, since you did all the work, wrap it up. And uh, thank you, everyone, again, for joining in. It, it was great. Thank you. Well, thanks, Tanner. You've been a, a wonderful MC. We definitely appreciate uh, your work there. And yes, it's been a pleasure of presenting to you all today. And I hope that it was informative and fun and a great way to just uh, spend some time on a Wednesday learning about uh, what DIC, what CT can really do for you to uh, in your testing endeavors in the future. And so uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Uh, you, can go, you can contact us on Trillion.com. And um, yeah, it's just up in the little corner there on the contact page. And we're happy to help answer any questions you might have.